we, we continue with the uh, dynamics of swirling flames. You know that uh, swirling flames are very important in, in practice. Uh, many, many devices use swirlers to stabilize flames. How is the flame stabilized by swirling? What is the principle of stabilization with swirl? What happens? Vortex breakdown, recirculation zones. So in fact, the swirling flow produces a recirculation zone in the center. It's an inner recirculation zone. Produces also outer recirculation zones. And uh, these recirculate hot gases. And uh, these hot gases stabilize the flame. So you are in a flow. Uh, of course, the... Uh, you have to create this rotation, uh, this flow rotation. Once it, this is created, of course, it will there will be vortex breakdown. There will be uh, things like that. But basically, it's a matter of recirculation. The the recirculation takes place. You have a you have a system with an outlet here. This is very simplified, and uh, what you produce is a recirculation. Uh, of that kind, right here. So the the flow is is uh, rotate, rotating in this direction, but you you produce a recirculation of that kind, and so you have here hot gases, and the flame will sit somewhere here. You don't want the flame to to touch the, uh, the metallic parts because they will be too hot. So you would like to have a flame stabilized in the flow. Uh, sometimes you have also outer recirculation region here, like that, because all of that is in the chamber. And uh, so again, you have hot gases right here. Uh, the flame will look more or less like a V flame uh, at a distance from the, from the injector. Sometimes when the stabilization is not enough, you can put a rod in the center. That's what we are going to do here. In, in our early studies, we had also a rod. But basically, you would like just the, 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 the flame be stabilized in the center. So uh, swirl is, is used in jet engines. It's used uh, in modern lean premixed gas turbines. Uh, it is used in various combustion processes to stabilize the flame. Swirling flames are uh, therefore very important and the dynamics of the swirling flames are important. So the, the stabilization relies on this uh, uh, central recirculation region and also sometimes on outer recirculation. Uh, you can calculate now these such flames. You see here, that, that's a calculation down in our lab of such uh, very nice swirling flames. Uh, uh, they are used in, in, uh, in, in uh, gas turbines, and in gas turbines, you may have combustion-driven oscillations, and we want to cope with that. Uh, now, the objective here is to study the interaction of such flames. Uh, you see, we want to, where is it? The interaction between a swirler and the actual acoustic waves determine the effects of this interaction on the flame. Use the describing function and uh, use that in uh, generic systems. So uh, this, this shows our this is uh, the device, the laboratory device. So we, we have this swirling flame here, sitting here. And we do here laser Doppler measurements. It's always very interesting to actually measure the velocity profiles. For example, you know that one quantity which is of interest in swirling flames is the swirl number. Very often, the swirl number is not quoted. So you don't know what is the swirl number. 
Very often the swirl number is given from the geometry. You deduce the swirl number just by saying, I have this angle, uh, this is the actual velocity, so I get the swirl number. It's the geometrical swirl number. But the best one is the one that you determine from profiles. Uh, so, uh, so basically, uh, the, the determination of the velocity profile is important to get the swirl number. So, and the swirl number is really very important. Uh, if it's too high, it's not so good. If it's too low, it's not so good. It's, there is a region where the swell number uh, uh, allows you to stabilize the flame properly at a certain distance from the injector. Uh, and uh, what, what is found immediately when you measure the transfer function or the describing function is that there is a, the gain has a, a trough here. You, you see there is a region where there is very low level and here again, the gain is higher. So that, that was found in, in our experiments. Also, the, the phase is not quite um, linear. It has this special behavior. And if you look at the uh, chemiluminescence and use the Abel transform, you see, uh, at 60 hertz, when you are in the trough, you see this sort of behavior of the flame. When you are at 90 hertz, you have a different behavior. So you see that uh, the flame behaves here very different from here. And uh, the fact that you have a, uh, a low level of the gain like that, that you have this behavior, tells you that something must happen, that so some interference must be there. Why is it that you have a very low level of gain there? And uh, the question is as follows. Suppose you have acoustic waves, longitudinal here, in a duct. Then you have acoustic waves on this out, uh, coming out. And now you put a swirler here. You see a swirler is like a, a set of um, veins at a, with a certain angle. It's like... Um, uh, what, what you find in turbo machinery, it's, uh, it's a, no, uh, it's a um, how do you call that? Um, a, uh, a, a, not a cascade, but a... Uh, you have impellers, yes, but a stator. Yeah, it's a stator uh, with a certain set of... Uh, yeah? Guide veins, yes, they are guide veins. So anyway, they are at an angle. They are at an angle, and uh, what happens when the acoustic wave reaches this, uh, uh, this region? What, what, is the, uh, what is the result on the, on the downstream <coughs> side? Of course, you will have the, the acoustic wave. It will be there. There will be some acoustic wave. Also, there will be some reflection to the back. But in addition to that, and this is a big thing, there will be, you see, the, there is a paper by Nick Comstey uh, from uh, Cambridge and Frank Marble, my advisor. They, uh, they were studying entropy waves getting into a blade row. That, that's, the, that's what I wanted, the blade row. And uh, what they uh, explained is that when you have entropy waves here, and you go through the black, uh, blade row, you have pressure waves here. What we have here is different. You have acoustic waves coming in here. They hit a blade row. And on this side, you will have an acoustic wave. But in addition, you will have a vorticity mode. You produce vorticity. You produce vorticity on the downstream side of this blade row. And so uh, on the downstream, you have the acoustic wave, but you have the vorticity wave. And uh, it's the sum of these two. This is the acoustic mode, and in addition, you have this convective mode. And this, this propagates at the velocity u2, the velocity on this side, while this propagates at the velocity c. I showed the paper, this paper, because you can use that paper to actually study this problem. They, they used it to study 
entropy waves getting into the cascade. And we used the same conditions. Uh, it's a, it's a, a theory which is named actuator disk theory. So I didn't have to make the theory again. I, I used the, the results. I knew that they were very reliable because these people are reliable. Don't use results from people who are not reliable. <laughs> And there are a number of papers like that as well. So you have to distinguish who is doing uh, the right things. Uh, so anyway, you use the, the paper, you use the conditions of Marble and Comsty in 77, and you can get B, you see, because the problem B is what is the level of this vorticity? Is it important or is it just a second order effect? And it is important. For example, we did calculations. Uh, this is in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. It uh, was done with Paul Pagliès. We place a blade row here. We put an acoustic wave on the upstream and we look at the velocity downstream. This is U prime two. So this is the actual velocity corresponding to the acoustics. And this is the velocity corresponding to the vorticity. You see, you have transverse velocity here uh, produced by the vorticity that you have on the downstream side. It's not negligible. It's of the same order as the as U prime two. And uh, this is a different case. This is 60 hertz. This is 100 hertz. So, uh, and we, we really wanted to verify that. So we put the swirler inside this duct and we, uh, we have a, a certain velocity here. We use the 60 and 100 hertz the loudspeaker, so you send acoustic waves, you have the squirler, and what do you get at the laser, with the laser Doppler? So if you get only actual uh, fluctuations, you don't have the transformation, but you do get the two velocities. You get the, the V prime velocity, it's a convective mode, you, by displacing your, your uh, velocity, uh, uh, the volume, uh, uh, the, the measurement volume, you can show that the velocity is convective. V prime is a convective mode. U prime, U prime is an acoustic mode, which the, the phase doesn't change because it's acoustic. It's a very small thing. So you essentially ch do not change the phase. But V prime is associated with convective uh, velocities. And this is indeed what, what is observed. You see, you, you, you do see that this changes with the lengths and, uh, and so you have a convective mode again. So uh, the swirler transforms the acoustic wave into an acoustic wave, which is there right, because it's still there, but you also have vortices. And in fact, you cannot solve the actuator disk problem without the vorticity wave. And, and, and then when you solve it, you get the result. So what is the, the level of B is, is obtained uh, in, in these calculations? Perhaps I gave it somewhere here. No, I didn't give it. So, but it's in the paper. It's one of our papers. B is, uh, can be obtained from A. It's uh, directly related to A here, A over rho C. B is, the, it's just the tangent of the angle uh, of this uh, of these blades. All right. So now, uh, now what happens when when you have the flame? So this is the device. This is a very simple device again with the the flame stabilized by swirl and the, there is still a rod here. Um, the swirl number is 0.55. This is a measured swirl number. So again, we want to characterize that using this transfer function uh, or the describing function. And, uh, and you remember that we showed that the describing function could explain a lot of the dynamics of the system. And we, we, we continued this effort with these papers. And uh, just to, to tell you a little more, if you do linear analysis, this is what you get. You do not see everything here. The only, the only idea that you get are for very low perturbations. So linear stability 
gives you a very small window on the reality. You, you look at the reality, but through a very small window. When you use the describing function, sorry, I thought, well, all this goes away and you see, you uncover all this uh, physics. All right, so here is the describing function. We, we actually want to change the, the level of uh, oscillation here. We use the loudspeaker. This is the, the mounting, the photomultiplier. Uh, the swirler is here. In this case, it's a, it's a swirler made of blades. It's a blade row. Uh, and uh, this is what we get. This is a typical transfer function. And you see the gain is changing. Not so much the phase. Apparently, the phase is, is sensitive, but not by much. Uh, but the gain definitely is changing. And also, we have this, this uh, place where there is interference. And in fact, in the literature, uh, this is also found by others. It's not just uh, by us. For example, Komarek and Polifke. Uh, were publishing this paper where, where they see uh, uh, a behavior of the same kind. What they did was to move the position of the swirler inside the duct, and they see that this changes the gain. So for example, for a, if the swirler is at 130 millimeters, you have essentially something like that. If you are at 90 millimeters, you have something like that. And if you are 30 millimeters, it's like that. And you see that even their phases are changing because of that. Uh, very little at 130 millimeters and this, this behavior for the others. So, um, but they, uh, this, they, they were suspecting that there was a, a wave, uh, a convective wave there, a vorticity wave but they were not giving the amplitude of that wave. The amplitude is obtained from, uh, by, by making use of the theory of the actuator disk theory, and we gave the amplitude. So, uh, so basically what happens is as follows. You have the swirler, you produce actual fluctuations, azimuthal fluctuations, V prime. Uh, this will produce vortex roll up this will produce swell number fluctuations. So this, the vorticity wave will produce, together with the acoustic wave, will produce swell number fluctuations. In fact, the swell number fluctuations you can show is the composite of these two things. So you have, these are the velocity in the transverse in the azimuthal direction. These are the velocities in the uh, in the actual direction, and they combine and they produce swell number fluctuations. This will produce heat release fluctuations because the swell number is, is variable, and, uh, and this will produce heat release fluctuations through this process. So, uh, and in addition, what we have is that V prime over V bar is related to U prime over U bar uh, with an exponential, uh, there is a phase here, and also there must be some, some sort of uh, factor in front. So swell number fluctuations, uh, vortex roll up of the flame sheet, and these combine, and they may combine constructively, they give the, the maximum, and destructively, they give the minimum. And, and this is actually verified. This is uh, measurements uh, with the flame. So you have here the actual velocity fluctuations, and here are the azimuthal velocity fluctuations. And the swell number that can be deduced from that is, uh, exhibits 50% fluctuations, very, very large scale fluctuations of the swell number due to this acoustic and vorticity uh, uh, fluctuations combining. So you have a flame which is not anymore at constant swell number it's, the swell number is, is changing. And of course, that has a big effect on, on stabilization and on, on the flame response to, to uh, incoming perturbations. Uh, at 90 hertz, 
the situation is different. You see the, these are more or less in phase in this case, and the swirl number doesn't uh, exhibit such l very large fluctuations. They are lower. And, uh, and so what, what we were explaining is on one hand, we have a process where the angle of the flame is changing and in the, uh, the other process is vortex roller. So uh, everything depends on the phase of these two processes. So what is seen here is basically the 60 Hertz and this is 90 Hertz. And uh, the scale that is given here, it is possible to actually uh, give a, uh, um, calibrate the intensity that you measure with a uh, photomultiplier and give it in terms of watts per cubic meter. So for example here, you have 18, 10 to the seven watts per cubic meter uh, of heat release. So some regions uh, have a very high heat release and there are low, lower levels of heat release. So this is the behavior at 90 Hertz. This is the behavior at 60 Hertz. This is done by chemiluminescence with an able transform to get the slice. So what you see here is basically the slice through the flame. Uh, of course, as we have uh, the capacity to do calculations, is it possible to represent something like that using calculations? So this is the, uh, the burner, the injector. There is a, uh, at that point, we have a, um, uh, the swirler, and then we have the, the chamber. And uh, above the chamber, we put an ambient domain representing the atmosphere so that the waves can go out. Uh, uh, it, it's not good to put the downstream immediately here. So in addition to what you do here, you add a big ambient domain. And like that, everything goes out and is finally dissipated and doesn't interact with. So it, it is a representation of what actually is an open uh, uh, exhaust. And, uh, and so you see here the measurements and the calculations here. So the calculations are pretty close, not quite. Uh, this is 90 hertz. This is 60 hertz. So you see that uh, there, there is some resemblance. The, the level of, uh, of Q dot is also pretty good. Uh, you see here it's two 10 to the eight, it's 1.8, 10 to the eight here. So, uh, so uh, it matches reasonably well, not quite. Yeah. But uh, this is a calculation of, of a whole cycle. So you, you calculate the cycle and you, you have something which, which, uh, which is matching. Uh, again, it's, uh, nothing is perfect. It's, uh, you have to be, uh, we would like to, to, to be better, but it's okay. It's still, uh, you, you can, there are good similarities, not everything, but some of it. So, uh, and it is also possible to do uh, analysis. Uh, uh, of course, you always want to get a, an analytical expression of the transfer function. Uh, it's in this case, again, we, we start with the G equation, the perturbed G equation, which writes in this form. And uh, what we see is, what, what we, we write here is that we have the velocity perturbations and we have perturbations in the burning velocity. That is, the swell number fluctuations are transformed into burning velocity fluctuations. So uh, it is important to model that. Uh, for the velocity fluctuations, we know how to describe their effects on the, on, on the flame. What about these? And uh, in fact, what we've done is to say, well, the transfer function for the, the whole thing is the transfer function for the velocity fluctuations multiplied by one minus the fluctuation, the relative fluctuations of the, the, of the burning velocity divided by the relative fluctuations of the 
actual velocity. And this is given more or less empirically in terms of the fluctuations in the azimuthal velocity and the actual velocity. And themselves are given in terms of these actual velocity fluctuations with a certain phase because this corresponds to the different times of uh, propagation of the acoustic wave and the vorticity wave. There is a little bit of um, phenomenology here. And, uh, and when you do that, and uh, you, you, you have to determine this phase phi, and then uh, this is how the, this, the transfer function looks like, and you can actually get the transfer function which is close to what is uh, experimental. You see, even the phase is rather close to the phase here, and uh, a second case is also reasonably well represented. So more or less, even for such a complicated situation, a swirling flame, by a suitable combination of the transfer function for just the velocity and some, uh, some uh, modeling of the burning velocity, which itself depends on the uh, fluctuations in the swirling, uh, swell number, you get the transfer function. This is what we get, some fairly good agreement. Of course, there, there are some differences in phase. It's not quite the same. So now, uh, it, it is interesting to, to use this knowledge. You have the flow, you have the swirler. Again, the flow, combustion, and goes to acoustics. So you have the loop here. We know the, the describing function for this system. And we can apply our modeling. Uh, somewhat in a similar manner as we did before. So the burner is represented as a cavity one. Then you have a, uh, you have a, a cavity two. So we represent this nozzle by a second cavity. And then we have the, the combustion chamber. So we change the size of this uh, L3, four sizes. We have three sizes for the burner. And we have two operating points, so it makes four times three times two, 24. So you have 24 cases and you want to predict uh, which ones are unstable and which ones are stable. So we, we use this concept of describing function. We calculate the omega i of u prime. Uh, in, this in this case, you have some damping. So it is important to get an idea of this damping. And, uh, and, and, and I told you the best way is to use uh, uh, acoustic uh, resonance and look at the, uh, at the, the thickness of the resonance peak. Like that, you get uh, an idea of the damping. Uh, in addition, we use for the, f for the flame itself, we use something that we introduced at the beginning of these lectures. Uh, this is uh, downstream of the flame, upstream, and this is related to the heat release fluctuation through this uh, parameter. Rho zero C square is equal to gamma P, so that's very simple. And, uh, and you get up with a system, uh, it's a homogeneous system, uh, which has, uh, the flame is included there uh, inside this, K term, it depends on the, uh, omega and the level of uh, excitation. Uh, you see the setup is A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, and uh, the flame is in here. When K is equal to zero, there is no flame, so you do just a straightforward uh, 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 acoustic analysis. And uh, experimentally, when L3 is uh, 100 millimeters, I don't know what, what the burner is, a short burner, flame A. And you see that the pressure is essentially zero. Uh, the system is, uh, is stable. When L3 is 400 millimeters, it's unstable, and heat release is, is also oscillatory. And uh, so this is one case. And so for that case, so first of all, you, you need to get the level of, um, of damping. 
and we found that the damping was about 50 seconds minus one. It's around here. So uh, in this case, definitely the trajectory is here. You start from here, you get here, and so we are on the side where the growth rate is lower than the damping. For the 400 millimeter, definitely the trajectory is on the other side. You, you get a trajectory here, and this is the limit cycle at a frequency of about 100 hertz and at a level which is around uh, somewhere here. So, so you see the, the application of these concepts of uh, describing function tell you where the trajectory is, and you have the trajectory here. This is stable, this is unstable. You need to know what, the, what is the, the damping. Uh, this is the, uh, it's not so easy, because um, if you really want to get the, the right damping, you, you must have the flame operating. But if the flame is operating, it has its own um, effect. So you need to take that into account when you measure the damping. So uh, one of the reviewers was very careful about that and he, he said, you, you, you have a problem here. And uh, for some time, I, I, I wasn't able to sleep. I, I thought, well, how do I go around that? But we go around it by actually taking into account the growth rate of the stable flame. So that has to be subtracted from the damping that you measure. So it's tricky because you measure a damping, but the flame is there and the flame is active. You measure that under stable conditions. Nevertheless, the flame has a certain uh, growth rate. So you have to determine this growth rate. You subtract that from the damping, and this is the right, the right damping. That's, at least that's the solution I got. So, I, so, and then once you've done that, you, you get these answers. And, uh, all right, and, uh, and what happens to the 24 cases? Most of the cases are suitably predicted. There are a few cases which are not. That's, uh, uh, the, the result is that in general, you predict well. Uh, there are a few cases which are just in between. But it's, uh, it's a complicated problem, and uh, so uh, you cannot expect to have everything perfect. Any questions on this? I have a question. Yes. The swell number fluctuations. It's the, yes, the swell number describes the momentum associated with azimuthal uh, motions divided by the momentum in the actual direction. In general, this is a number which, which is a, a constant. You, you measure the, the, the profiles uh, you integrate the profiles uh, and you get, in, in, in fact, the, this it poses a little problem because in, in principle, you need to have also the pressure. There is a pressure term in the swell number, which is usually neglected. So that's already a little problem. But okay, you measure that. Now, this swell number can fluctuate, in fact, because you have now velocities which are not constant. They, they fluctuate, and so you have two types of fluctuations to take into account. And when you do the calculation based on the swell number expression, without the pressure term, you have V prime theta divided by V bar theta minus V prime X divided by V bar X. This is an expression that you can just derive from the swell number expression. And uh, what you see is that this swell number, which defines the geometry of the flame, the, the, the swell number is extremely important in the definition of the geometry. Uh, it fluctuates. So it has an effect. And what we've translated the effect in terms of burning velocity. 
because uh, in, the, uh, in the G equation, what you have is fluctuations of the flow and fluctuations of the burning velocity. So we use the, the G equation, and in the G equation, we said, okay, we have swell number fluctuations. They are reflected in terms of burning velocity. So uh, it's, it's effective. It works. Uh, it, there are a few parameters there, so it's not quite... Uh, uh, that's what we came up with. Of course, you can certainly improve that. It's, uh, now, we, we have also uh, experimental transfer functions. So uh, the theoretical values are uh, less important, especially, and in addition, uh, you cannot get a uh, describing function with that. You, you get just the, the transfer function. If you were, doing, if you were using the G equation numerically, then you could get something which is uh, dependent on the amplitude as well. Yes, you are doing something like that. You are using the G equation. Uh, the problem with the numerical G equation is that uh, across the flame, you have a, a temperature changing. And as a consequence, you have to accommodate that in a numerical uh, method. And, and so you have to give a thickness to the flame or to the region of uh, going from one, from the cold to the hot, and, and, and so you lose the advantage of the G equation. We, we used it uh, also in numerical work, for example, with Thierry Schuller, we did uh, uh, calculations with the G equation for conical flames, for example. It works well, it's, uh, but you have this problem. Non? Non-premixed flames is a, is a difficulty because this is essentially for premixed. The, the G equation for, is for premixed. So uh, there, there, there is a possibility by introducing a, a mixture fraction and uh, using the combination of mixture fraction and, uh, and, uh, and the G. And All right, so uh, let's move to, yeah. So uh, this was more or less, we thought the damping that we get uh, has some uncertainty. And uh, it was more, uh, just to say, it's not quite one value, it's... But uh, how do you actually measure this? Oh no, Th so what you measure, you see again, I I'll tell you again. The measurement of the damping of a simple system, you take, you take your, your burner. You put a microphone at the bottom, M0. You put a microphone on this side, M1. You place a loudspeaker here. Uh, you send here a frequency. And you get the response by, by plotting the, the, the signal of the microphone M0 divided by the microphone M1. M1 serves as a reference, and this system is resonating. So what you get is something which will be of that kind. So this is the resonance frequency, and uh, at half height, you measure delta F. A resonance system is usually characterized by the quality factor, Q is equal to F0 over delta F. And the damping rate, let's call it zeta, is proportional to delta F. I think it's pi times delta F. So for a simple system without reaction, the, the method is you determine delta F. If delta F is very small, the quality factor is very high and you get a very strongly resonant system. If, uh, if zeta, if, if delta F is large, you get a, a, a low quality factor. In some cases, you want to have a very high quality factor. For example, in your, in your radio set, when you want to have a very fine tuning, the resonance have very, has to be very strong. Uh, in, uh, on the other hand, if you have mechanical systems, 
you want them to be damped. You don't want uh, uh, the system to resonate. You know, for example, in some cars, you open the rear window and the whole uh, um, cabin uh, resonates because for some reason the air passing by is, is um, making vortices and something and, and the whole thing resonates. You don't want resonance. You, so now the problem is the following. You, you now have a, a flame here. So the system is this one and you have a flame. So, and you measure the damping in this configuration. However, because the flame is there, it has its own growth rate. Uh, if it's a stable flame, it means that the growth rate omega i is smaller than alpha, the, 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 the real damping rate. But what you measure is the sum of the two. So you have to subtract that. So by calculation, you, you know the omega i, you subtract it from the alpha that you get, you get alpha prime, and this is the one that you use. So uh, this difficulty, for a little, a little while, I, I didn't know how to, to go around it. The, the initial, what we had made initially was not quite right. This is why, uh, uh, why uh, the reviewers are very important. Uh, they improve your papers. Let me tell you, so one author, uh, always sends papers which are very, uh, very poorly written. I won't say who that is. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and what happens? So, of course, we are very kind to him and, and we improve his paper. So, uh, I remember one case when one reviewer uh, made 24 pages of remarks about the paper. I, I did, I, I, I did uh, also a number of remarks and the paper was really, re uh, uh, improved tremendously by the reviewers. <laughs> that was uh, so. Anyway, in this case, uh, we our paper was improved because we uh, the question was very good. Uh, the, the reviewer was saying, "But you have the flame; it operates. How do you uh, cope with that?" And and so we we came out with the answer here. So. Uh, Let's move to uh, the next topic. So the next topic now, little by little, we get to uh, real stuff. In this case, now we, we are uh, getting closer to, to systems uh, where we have uh, Various types of modes. Most of what I've shown up to now was essentially modes which were longitudinal, plain wave modes, uh, simple modes. But now we, we have to take into account situations like this one where the modes can be also azimuthal. So uh, let me show you what I mean. So the, this first uh, part is to do some modal analysis. Uh, you, uh, what we want to examine is situations, typical situations that we have. For example, rectangular cavities or cylindrical cavities or uh, the ones that, that are very interesting to us are annular cavities because the gas turbine combustors very often are annular. In jet engines, most of them, essentially all of them are annular. In gas turbines, not quite, but many of them are annular. So how does one go to examine these modes? So let's, let's first look at the rectangular cavity. So here you have a cavity with a different, uh, with, with three sizes here. It's rectangular, LX, LY, LZ. Uh, let's assume that the walls are rigid, but you can also use other boundary conditions. The rigid wall indicates that the velocity is zero. And what we look at is modes which are at a given frequency. So we put P is equal to psi of X, E to the minus I omega T. The uh, psi has to satisfy the Helmholtz equation. We learned that this equation was 
was, uh, was the equation for harmonic waves. And uh, we want to solve that equation. And uh, we want to solve that with the with a proper boundary conditions. Now, if the velocity, uh, if, if the walls are rigid, the normal velocity must be zero. That is, you have pressure, but this is so rigid that it won't move, so the velocity, the normal velocity has to be zero. It's not the velocity itself, because this would be too much. Um, you know that when you are, this is in the, the context of the Euler equations or the acoustic equations. And for the Euler equations, the only thing you can do is to say the normal velocity is zero. Uh, there is slip for the, the Euler equations. If you are using the Navier-Stokes equations, you can actually say the velocity is equal to zero at the boundary. But in this case, it's just the normal velocity. And this translates directly into d psi by dn is equal to zero. The gradient of psi in the normal direction is equal to zero. Or if you wish, it's n times the gradient of psi is equal to zero at the boundaries. Now, we have to, to make that clearer, so how does the equation look like? It's d2 psi by dx squared plus d2 psi by dy squared plus d2 psi by dz squared plus k squared. k is omega over c. And in fact, this is what we want to determine. And also the shape of psi is equal to 0. And uh, what are the boundary conditions? Well, on the... Uh, on the uh, on the wall that is, for example, we have d psi by dx is equal to zero. On the uh, on the wall located at uh, at x is equal to zero. Uh, and d psi by the dx is equal to zero at x is equal to Lx. And we have similar conditions for y and z. d psi by dy is equal to 0 at y is equal to 0. And d psi by dy is equal to 0 at y is equal to Ly. And, um, and similar for z. So how do we solve such a system? How do we get that? Well, the best method to solve a partial differential equation like that is to say, psi, let's, let's try to see a solution which, which is a function of x is a function of x, big Y is a function of Y, and big Z is a function of Z. This is called separation of variables. You, you try to see if you have solutions, separation of variables. You can always try that, and you will see if it works. When you put that into the equation, you see the, uh, the equation becomes x double prime yz plus x, y double prime, z, plus x, y, z double prime, plus k square, x, y, z, is equal to 0. And we divide by x, y, z. So x double prime over x, plus y double prime over y, plus z double prime over z, plus k square is equal to 0. When you look at that, you rapidly, you see this is essentially a function of x. 
this is a function of y, this is a function of z. To have something like that, the only possibility is that each of these ratios be also a constant. So we can say x double prime of x is equal to minus alpha squared. y double prime of x of y divided by y is equal to minus beta squared. z double prime, you can try something different, but finally you get to this, this, this only possibility is minus gamma squared. So, uh, or we can call that minus kx squared. I don't remember what I, what I used, ky squared, kz squared. Yeah, perhaps this is the notation. It's, it's, uh, it's up to you. So uh, if we do that, you see that k squared is equal to kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. And, uh, and now, what, what are the boundary conditions on these functions? Well, you find that x prime of zero is equal to zero, and x prime of uh, Lx has to be equal to zero. And similar conditions for y and z. So you get, yes? No, 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 you, you just, you see, you, you take all this, place that here, and you get this. I, I know, but I'm not asking about the k, uh, k squared or uh, xi. This makes the final equation non-homogeneous. You have separate between homogeneous and non-homogeneous. For the homogeneous, we will make the separation of variable, and then finally we can decide that, right? I mean, the last, the last term. Here? The no. K, Okay. No, KZ, you see all these, the three directions are similar. Mm. So they behave in the same way. Each of these problems, uh, each, the problem for X, the problem for Y, the problem for Z are the same. But one is a function of X, one is a function of Y, one is a function of Z. Let me go to the end of the solution and, and afterwards we, we can. And, uh, and very rapidly you see that the that the solution of the, let's, let's take the, the system for x. You see the uh, x, of, uh, x of x satisfies an equation x double prime plus kx squared x is equal to zero. So we can say immediately x is equal to a e to the i kx plus b e to the minus i kx. Uh, and x prime is equal to a i k e i kx minus i k b e minus i kx. Put that for x is equal to zero, you see that a is equal to b. And then uh, put that for x is equal to Lx, we have x prime of Lx should be equal to zero. So it, it indicates that e to the i k Lx minus e to the minus i k Lx is equal to zero. And this is translated into sinus of k Lx is equal to zero, kx lx. So the conclusion is as follows, a, a is equal to b, so it's e to the i kx x. Uh, this is cosine kx, so the x of x, there is a constant in front, but you can say cosine of kx x. And the values of co, uh, kx, <coughs> are given by this expression, kx lx should be a, uh, a certain, let's say, m times pi. You have that. 
So finally, the result is as follows. Kx is equal to m pi divided by Lx. And the shape of x is given by that. So let me try to conclude that. You see, you have to solve these problems. They are all similar. And, uh, and they are solved as I, as I showed here. And uh, kx is just a, a certain number times pi over K, L, lx. And so the frequencies can be obtained from that directly. And you get the modes for this uh, chamber. So you have here, this is a typical modal calculation for a, for a chamber. So if you are in a rectangular chamber, you know the, the sizes, you know the frequencies corresponding to this chamber. They are given here. Suppose that all the walls are rigid, you have the, all the modes. In a big chamber like that, you have a, a very large number of modes. You know, in a small, smaller chamber, in cavities like that, you have a, a finite number. So here you have a, you can calculate them. You know, I, uh, th this is a, a homework if you want to practice uh, the calculation of these fre frequencies. So in these simple situations, you can actually calculate the, the eigenfrequencies. All right, I think uh, we did a lot of material today, <laughs> perhaps too much. Uh, I don't know if, uh, so what we've done is uh, we looked at, uh, first of all, at the describing function concept then we looked at um, uh, control concepts. How do we control flames? I showed you one way to, when you can actually shape the, uh, uh, the gain of the, of, the of the transfer function, of the describing function. And then we looked at swelling flame dynamics. The important aspect there is that there is a, uh, a, uh, a vorticity convection there and you cannot just uh, not take that into account because it comes out from the equations. It's, uh, it is present. I showed that uh, experimentally you, f you observe these vortices. Uh, you just uh, numerically, you get the vortex uh, um, mode also present. It's there. And then uh, we looked at the effects of that. And finally, we, uh, uh, now we undertook to, to study the um, uh, these um, this modes in cavities uh, to, to see how, how we do this modal identification. So in this case, we, we looked at modes which are more complex than the, the previous ones, the, the purely plane. So this is an example. So I derived things here using this separation of variable, which is a, a method that you've certainly learned. If you didn't, here it is, you, you got the the method, it's simple. It doesn't always apply. You, know, you, you, do, you are not always able to do separation of variable. But here you can. In a cylindrical ca uh, cavity, you can. In an annular cavity, it's possible. So there are at least a few cases where you can do separation of variables. All right, I think it's time to, to go for lunch. Thank you. Good.